<laughs> Let's start with prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful morning. Thank you, thank you that we can start here in your presence. Thank you that you yeah, uh, looked forward to have fellowship with us this morning. And you have m many things on your heart to teach us, to train us, to show us, to reveal us, to enlighten us, to strengthen us, to heal us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are real, that you are alive, and that you yeah, are ready to talk to us this morning. Amen. Amen. I, as a teacher, I hear one sentence maybe nearly every day. I am so stupid. <laughs> and I decided to fight that sentence to the death. And uh, every time I hear a pupil saying, a student saying, I am so stupid, I say, no, no, no. Do you mean I made a mistake? <laughs> and normally the pupils, they look a bit puzzled because they do not really uh, understand what I mean. They think like, uh, I did say the same as you. <laughs> but there's a big difference if I say I made a mistake or if I curse myself and say I am stupid. Uh, that's a big mistake. And yeah, we want to look at one psalm this morning and um, where David dealt with his sin. And it's always interesting to go uh, into a, the depth of a psalm, not only by reading what is there, but also by pondering uh, and that you realize what is not there. So we can open our Bibles to Psalm 51, a very famous psalm that uh, yeah, I preached on, I think, now for the third time. But it's so precious and so deep, and I want to concentrate this morning on one verse. We start uh, in verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. And we see here in the beginning that David is so courageous. And every time I read that psalm, I'm, I'm fascinated about David's attitude and about his faith in God's grace. Because if you think about his sin, what he did you could easily get depressed. If you realize you murdered somebody, you um, slept with another man's wife, and not only that, but you waited a whole year to realize, oops, I did a mistake. So this was not the whole year waiting, was not making it more easy for David when he realized, oops, <laughs> I did a great mistake or several mistakes. And I'm so fascinated how much he had a clear understanding how to deal with his own failure and with his own sin. And we, we see in this um, psalm that he did not um, make his sin small. You think of other kings in that time, uh, other kings we read in the Bible, uh, like King Nebuchadnezzar, he would not have thought twice um, about this uh, thing. He would have never considered this as a problem. Because kings in that time, they thought, oh, the people, they are mine. They are my slaves. So why should I even think about killing one or killing a thousand? But David um, was, um, yeah, in that time, was sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit showed him how he felt about this sin. And David also was not excusing himself and saying, oh, the circumstances, uh, why did this woman bath outside? Couldn't she bath inside? Then I would not have sinned. No, the problem was with his heart and he was clearly um, realizing that. And he was also not um, condemning himself. And the whole psalm, we don't read a single time where David is um, yeah, condemning himself and saying, oh, why did I do this? How was I stupid? We don't find any, um, any verse where he does um, not see his value. And we don't find a verse that devalues himself and saying, I'm so stupid. I, why does God even love me anymore? We don't find this. And oftentimes, we have those feelings and thoughts when we did a very little sin. 
and little mistakes. But those feelings and thoughts are so easy to uh, uh, rise up in our hearts that is, I'm fascinated about David because he had such a clear understanding about the grace of God. But what he did do was he was seeing um, that he himself was 100% guilty. That is so clear. He says even that all his own nature and from his childhood, from his birth, he was sinful. That means not that he was feeling bad about himself, but he was understanding that it's quite possible that I do mistakes. It's not a miracle that sometimes happens when I sin and when I do mistakes. It's natural for me, for David, um, to have mistakes. So he was not shocked. And a second point that he did, he was always looking forward for the grace of God. He was trusting in God's goodness and faithfulness. And he says, have mercy on me, O God. So it's the whole focus of David, it's God's mercy. It's not how bad he is, how um, sinful he is, how hopeless he is. It's always 100% how faithful God is. And the second part of verse 1 is that he yeah, really fascinated, fascinates me is blot out all my transgressions. We find that, uh, that, um, that plea for that cleansing six times in this psalm. Uh, David talks all the time of cleanse me, purify me, uh, um, forgive me all my sins. This is something that is very, very um, on David's heart. And I want to focus now on verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be wither than snow. And in this verse we have to remind ourselves of the time in which David lived. He was not living uh, in the Christian century. He was living in a time when the people of Israel, they had um, all the, the sacrifices. Those were the way that they had the sacrifices were the hope that the people of Israel had to get clean and get in peace with God again. And David says that he wants to be cleansed by God with hyssop. This was a little plant that the priest used to dip into water or dip into the blood of the sacrifice lamp or uh, animal and to sprinkle it on the person that sinned, that was in debt with God. And he was not uh, saying, I will go tomorrow to the temple and be cleansed. No, he says, right now, now in prayer, God, please cleanse me with that supernatural hyssop. So this was, David had a revelation that his going to the temple was not the real um, change in his life. But that supernatural thing that the Holy Spirit did in his heart was the real change. So David was already really seeing that, um, yeah, God needs to do something in my heart. And he says in the second line, wash me and I will be wither than snow. So David had such confidence that God is so able to remove my sin from me. And this is something that um, we as Christians we, after the death and resurrection of Christ, have oftentimes such a little revelation about. And I don't know about your situation. Maybe you have guilt in your life. You have a feeling of guilt for many, many years. And there's this guilt because you realized you damaged and destroyed a relationship. You damaged and destroyed maybe your family. You uh, threw away the trust that other people had in you. And... Maybe you uh, heard in the news about the Suez Canal. For me, it was very interesting and a bit funny um, how one ship um, blocked the whole um, industry of the world. And now I read that this poor guy uh, that um, yeah, blocked the Suez Canal. Uh, the Suez Canal is uh, in near Egypt, uh, a way that many ships go through and about 10% of the German um, industry comes through this, this canal and now this guy has a um, uh, he, um, the country of uh, Egypt they ask for one billion dollar <laughs> because this canal was blocked for nearly one week 
And I, I oftentimes thought about this poor guy, um, how he sleeps now, which thoughts go through his heart. And maybe you have not uh, a sin or a problem that is uh, as um, international as this, but oftentimes we have this um, condemnation and that fear in our hearts. Maybe it's just that knowledge and that realization that I am not living in the ways of God as God uh, wants me to. This can be a big pressure in my heart. And let's learn from David how to deal with it. And yeah, today we know that this um, request of David has fully been answered. David says, cleanse me and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And today we know that by the blood of Jesus, we have been cleansed once and for all. And the Hebrew, provider to the Hebrew says that we have been sprinkled, not with any hyssop from the Old Testament, but we have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And I, a few days in prayer, I, I uh, yeah, praised God and I said, holy, holy, holy. And I had the feeling like God was saying to me, but you too. Hallelujah. Oftentimes we focus on God's holiness, but we forget that his holiness makes me holy. And if I am realizing that in spiritually, my whole body is sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, then it's not good for me to just ponder about my failures, about my sin, about my inability to live holy. I should realize that I have been made holy, not by own strength, not by own works, but by the blood of Jesus. And why not? If we stand on, in front of the throne of God, realize that I have been made holy. I'm not a beggar coming to the throne of God. I'm a child of God that is totally holy and pure. And maybe I don't feel like it. <laughs> but uh, God does not um, ask my feelings to become right. He asks my belief to become right. And we can open one very precious verse to me. It's in Colossians 1. Where Paul explains that very, very clearly and not hard to understand. He's, Paul says in Colossians 1.22... He says how we should feel like when we come to the throne of God. He says in Colossians 1.22, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. So Jesus Christ was that lamb that shed his blood. And now you are sprinkled with his blood. And how should you feel like when you come to God? To present you holy in his sight without blemish. And you are free from accusation. So you should feel without blemish. And the very interesting thing is that this word without blemish is not only used to describe yourself. It is, described to, um, is used to describe the blood of Jesus. To be that, like in 1 Peter uh, 1.19, it is described with this word how this uh, perfect Lamb of God was. And this is amazing, that God would um, use an adjective for His Son as a sacrifice for all the sin. And now take the same adjective for you. And why? Because you have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Because this holiness that was in Jesus now came upon you. And this is one uh, revelation that we need to receive. Because otherwise, we will all the time come to the throne of God on the basis of our own feelings and our own works. And guess what? David was not feeling very clean when he prayed that prayer. David was not feeling perfect because he, all the time he says, please cleanse me. But in this verse, he breaks through to the revelation that he says in verse 7, Yes, if you clean me, I will be clean. And I will not be clean a little bit. I will be clean whiter than snow. 
And now we as Christians, we know that Jesus died on the cross for you and me. Not just forgive you a few sins and now God is hoping that you do, will do better. God says for one and for all times, you are holy without blemish. You are blameless and without reproach and above and without um, accusation. So why not realize and receive that really? But now you say, oh, this cannot be true. Because we all do mistakes and God knows we are all sinful. It's a big decision in my life if I concentrate on the new creation, what God did, how God transformed me, or if I am still stuck in my old creation, looking on all my human abilities and my human abilities to fail, to sin, or my evil heart, and I have bad dreams, and I think, oh, how could I dream such things, and you feel guilty, you feel dirty. It's a decision that you have to take, and you can take the old creation. <laughs> That's not a, good, not a good choice. I take the choice to concentrate on the new creation and I believe God's word that I have been made holy. If I feel it or not. Last uh, thing we want to go to is uh, for, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 where Paul helps us to um, deal with that uh, with that, yeah, tension between I have been made holy, but all, also I sometimes I do sin. And he says in First Thessalonians chapter three, the verses twelve and thirteen, he says, "May the Lord make you, make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you." So he says, "I pray that that your love may increase." Yeah, that means the love is not yet increasing or has not come to the full measure. So there is a measure for me to grow. Okay? I do, some, I do mistakes and I have to grow. So Paul is very aware that I'm not perfect yet. And he goes on in verse 13. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with his, all his angels, his holy ones. Now he says, the goal is to be blameless. So first we heard we are blameless. And now Paul says, this is not just a place to rest and to enjoy and to uh, forget about all the truth. <laughs> this is a place where I want to receive all um, holiness from God. But I want to become that what I became. And I want to live out what I became. And he says that God needs to strengthen our hearts, that we will be blameless and holy in this presence. So this is also a goal. So being forgiven, being purified, being cleansed and being holy is a thing that Jesus paid for once and for all at the cross. But now my goal is to receive it with, with all my heart, to pressure it, to honor it, and to have the desire to work it out more and more. And the way you see if somebody really realized that he is cleansed is love. And love is not just caring for every little need that you have. Jesus was not running around through his disciples and saying, Oh, can I help you with this? Can I help you with this? Oh, oh, um, Peter, you need a hat. The, the, the sun doesn't burn your head. And Jesus was not all the time running around doing things how he could serve the disciples in an earthly way. He was, but all the time he was concerned about their worth and about their calling. And that mean, that meant that Jesus was not serving them in li every little aspect in an earthly perspective. He was not running all the time to James. Oh, let me take your bag. I carry it. It's too hard for you. And let me this do for you. No. He was but always caring for their calling. And so he was allowing challenges in their lives that they realize what God's calling is in their life. And where he was always pointing out to holiness, to perfect holiness, that he on the cross paid for us so that we can have a desire to live it out.
Lord Jesus, we thank you very much for this wonderful morning and for these strong words that David used in his psalm. I thank you that those words can become ours to strengthen us in our confidence that you, through your death on the cross, paid for all my sin and changed my whole nature that I can say I am holy, I am blameless because you shed your blood. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit inside of me wants to um, yeah, work this out, that I love everyone with a pure love and with a pure motive. And I thank you that this is possible and we want to allow the Word of God to challenge us this morning that we reach out for your destiny that you have for us and also your calling. Amen.